going to begin with a little discussion on meditation and astrology, and we'll actually do a meditation. And you'll remember yesterday when we were talking about the Yoga Sutras, uh, I mentioned the sutra where it says the root cause of pain is due to a lack of self-awareness. The root cause of pain is due to a lack of self-awareness. And ideally astrology is supposed to help you get some self-awareness. And that self-awareness that astrology gives is related to your personality, basically. Now, the other important part of astrology is that once you get some awareness of your personality, then you have the capacity to start to consider, well, where does my personality come from? What is the source of my personality? Um, and in the meditation we did yesterday, you, you remember we kind of went through a similar process that we did on the first day of class, but then at the end I had you ask the question, what am I? And to meditate on, what am I? And when you do that, you can, you can mechanically turn that into like a mantra, or just, what am I, what am I? But it works better and really well if you don't treat it like a mantra, and you simply treat it like you are actually trying to figure out what you are. And one of the beauties of astrology is that the more you pay attention to how your life functions and how it relates to the movements of the planets or the movements of your planetary cycles and the dashas, the more you start to recognize that there is a one, one aspect of you which is temporal, which changes. One time you're in a good relationship, one time you're not. Uh, one time you're healthy, one time you're not. Uh, you start to see these sort of ups and downs and when you can relate them to the, the time cycles, the dashes, as well as the transits, you start to get a sense of there is another aspect of you which is eternal, which witnesses these things. In the same way that when you dream, uh, there's a reason that paying attention to your dreams in, in yoga practice and spiritual traditions is so important because when you pay attention to your dreams, you start to recognize that there are these things that occur that you, that you watch, that you experience, but then you always wake up the next morning. It's like the real you waking up. It's almost like a metaphor here. Uh, the birth chart, as we know, when we were looking at how the signs relate to the chakras, um, the birth chart is a map of your inner karmic state of your personality, basically. Okay, it's a map of the inner karmic state of your personality. Now, the reason I don't go into things like it is the map of your soul because your soul has no characteristics. Your soul is that which is one with the all. It's not defined by anything. And that's essentially what yoga practice is aiming to get us to pay attention to when we think about uh, the Yoga Sutras in Sutras 2 through 3 in chapter 1. Yoga is the process of ending fluctuations and changes in the field of consciousness. Then the seer abides in its own nature. So the seer here that's being described is what in yoga would be considered your actual soul. And sutras 4 through 5 says, otherwise, so when, when the seer is not abiding in its own nature, otherwise there is conformity to definitions, meaning there are concepts, there are things to think about, there are problems, there are desires, there are cravings and attachments. And so when you are not identified or being simply that seer, that soul awareness, the conformity to definitions occur, and that is where your birth chart comes into play. That's the conformity to definitions. Those definitions are reflected in your birth chart. Now, um, in chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through 13, or sutras 12 through 13, of the Yoga Sutras, it says, unconscious and subconscious impressions may result in the manifestation of unplanned experiences in this and other life cycles. As long as the causes of effects or karma reside in the unconscious, their influence can manifest according to species and span of life in relationship to perceptions of pleasure and pain. So I'll read that one more time, a little slower. Just listen. Unconscious and subconscious impressions may result in the manifestation 
of unplanned experiences in this and other life cycles, as long as the causes of effects, or karma, reside in the unconscious, their influence can manifest according to species and span of life and in relationship to perceptions of pleasure and pain. Now, these are from the Yoga Sutras, uh, but this, this in particular is from um, the final chapter in The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, Volume 1, where I talk about important sutras related to astrology. Now, the reason that sutra is important related to astrology is because, again, what you're seeing in the birth chart, it will reveal to you more than likely the majority of those unconscious subliminal tendencies that you have. Uh, those of you who've been alive long enough, have any of you uh, had the experience where life is going along the way you, you think it should, but then at some point in your life, all of a sudden you end up somewhere where you think, how did I get here? Any of you have, have had that experience? Well, if you had possibly talked to uh, an effective astrologer before that happened, they might have been able to say, Look, there's this time period in this area of your life where this is going to occur. And more than likely what you would say is, no, that's impossible. There's no way that's going to happen. And so you see the astrologer was able to look at that portion of your chart relationship to time and point out something that you are unconscious of, right? I mean, as you go through life, you will become a radically different person from time to time. That's because different aspects of your consciousness are coming up. And expressing themselves. Now, the key to astrology is not to get afraid or hung up on what the potentials are, because the astrological chart are potentials. In the same way, at least at this point in time, the way we think about genetics. Genetics, that's a potential. You know, your, your, your parents have diabetes and heart disease. It's a genetic predisposition you possibly have right? But if you eat your salad and go for a run every day and take care of your body, what is the likelihood compared to your parents that you're going to get diabetes or heart disease? It goes down, doesn't it? You still may get it, sure, but the chances of it become less. Now, there's a, a really great saying that I always love. It's, um, it's not that heart disease runs in your family, it's that no one runs in your family. <laughs> So, you can use that for many, many situations. Uh, so anyway, one aspect of astrology is trying to get some kind of understanding of what your subconscious tendencies might be in this lifetime. Okay, like what are the potentials that may or may not occur? Once you talk to an astrologer or you figured out for yourself what those are, then as we've been going over, you know, we've been talking about each individual planet and how if you choose to embody the highest qualities of that planet, you likely won't really have to worry too much about that planet. If you choose to embody the highest potentials and qualities within your chart, there's less need to really worry about your chart. Now again, it doesn't mean that everything's gonna go perfectly all the time. But that is again where the practices of yoga and spirituality come into play. And as we talked about multiple times yesterday, there's a reason that surrender and non-attachment come up over and over and over again in spiritual circles, spiritual talks, spiritual ideals, spiritual philosophies. So while you work out what's in your chart, while you're working out what is in your chart, you simultaneously have to do the work of developing the capacity to exist in the world, participate in the world, without attachment, and in a surrendered state. So you see there's, there's two, uh, two tracks that you're walking here. One is dealing with what is appropriate in this material realm for you right now. The other is attending to what is appropriate to everyone everywhere, which is non-attachment, unattachment, um, surrender, and many of those other things that are listed in the Yoga Sutras as the Yamas and Niyamas. So that is, that is your role as you learn astrology. That's, that's the purpose of why you're doing it. Now, when it comes to meditation, which is the purpose of our talk at the moment, um, what, does, what does meditation do <clears throat> for you? And I'm gonna ask that question, 
And if you have an idea, just raise your hand and I want to see what your thoughts are on that. So what, do, what in your mind do you think meditation does? What is the purpose of it? Anybody got any ideas? Remember, just raise your hand. Um, I feel like it allows me to connect more deeply with um, an aspect of myself that observes thoughts and observes characteristics of myself and surroundings so I'm in a space that seems pre uh, detached from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so another person, why would that be important? Why is that important, what she just described? Because it offers silence. Right, okay, and that goes back right to the Yoga Sutras about ending the fluctuations and changes in consciousness. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, when Ramana Maharshi was asked, how is one to be enlightened? And he said, it's really very simple. You just have to be still. And when you're still, there's silence. Um, do you have any other ideas or thoughts about why meditation might be important? I mean, her talking about patterns, that sub it allows you to see patterns or subconscious right. patterns, mm -hmm. potentials, and be the observer rather than a hatch. Right, right. So it allows you to, to see the pattern. So when you, when you start to meditate well, um, Yes, you get calmer. Yes, you get clearer. Yes, you get more centered. But one of the things that most people come up against in the beginning, well, how many of you have a regular meditation practice? Okay, great. And by regular, I mean you do it every day. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. All right, how about you do it at least five times a week? Okay, great. Um, one of the things that people come up against in the beginning of their meditation practice, and sometimes later on after they've been doing it for a long time, is their mind all of a sudden has all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of distractions, all kinds of memories, all kinds of emotions come up. And it's usually at that point in time when a person says, well, I can't meditate. Why am I even trying? You know, many people do this. And the reason that's a problem, and I wish more people would talk about this, is because the moment you start to get silent and calm inside, well, all that undigested stuff that's down in there now has the opportunity to come out, reveal itself, and hopefully, if you can, if you can, you have to remain alert and relaxed and observant. And if you can do that, then it 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 resolves itself usually. But if it comes up and you start to get scared, or you start to say, "I can't do this," or you start to give in to whatever emotions are arising, then what's happening is it's coming up, and you are just simply reengaging that karma again. Another issue that people experience when they start to meditate, or even start to get some self-awareness related to astrology, especially astrology, if they get some self-awareness about maybe what they need to do and change in life, well then, what happens when you are in a family or a group of people, or you've got your, your circle, and all of a sudden you start to change? So what happens to the, to the people around you? <laughs> they don't like it. Yeah. They get uncomfortable. Why do they get uncomfortable? It's challenging. it's challenging. Because now, and you can look at it one way like saying, well, they're seeing how someone else is improving and they don't want to see that. But that's not really the case. What's happening is just like you were comfortable in that kind of state of consciousness and that way of being, well, they were, they were comfortable with you simply reflecting that comfortable space back to them. And so now they're seeing that, wait, something's changing. I don't want to have to adapt to something new because that's annoying. So it's, it's not always that they're really trying to sabotage you because they don't like the fact that you're trying to improve. It's simply that they don't want to change, right? And that's fine. And hopefully they'll eventually get over it and adapt. Um, but as someone learns about their astrological chart and they start to recognize, hey, I need to live my life differently, just like in meditation, when you start to get calm and clear and do the work, some more distractions, some more uncomfortableness comes up. When you start to become aware of what's going on karmically for you and you want to take charge of it, um, situations around you will also start to get a little more uncomfortable and difficult and, and sort of uh, there will be more friction there simply because you're just moving out of your lane, right? You're moving into another lane. You're kind of trying to change where you're going. So. When it comes to self-development through meditation and astrology, that those moments, those times when it feels like this isn't working or things are getting worse or 
um, I'm more uncomfortable, uh, usually it's because you are now actually doing the work that needs to be done for you. Now, when it comes, again, back to meditation, your astrological chart, you'll notice that the majority of the meditations that we've done this weekend have um, focused on keeping our awareness on the spine and keeping our awareness like in the chakra regions where the body, uh, where we have a sense of these energy centers of the chakras within the body. Now the reason that's the case is because whatever you bring your awareness to, energy goes to that space. Metaphysical energy, I'm not talking about electrons, maybe electrons, I don't know, but metaphysical energy goes to that space. And when metaphysical energy goes to that, spa that space, um, you then become aware of what is within that space. So we are going to be looking at your charts as examples today, because I know it's the third day and you've been very attentive, but I know that will keep you interested in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves to hear about themselves. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's the most interesting thing in the world, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so when we look at your charts, we're going to see planets in certain signs, just like in this chart. You know, we, we, we did the chart of the Dalai Lama yesterday, and we just saw how <laughs> amazing the Dalai Lama's chart matches with some very simple astrological principles. All we did was we made the chart. This isn't even, there's no degrees here. There's no, we didn't look at aspects. We didn't look at these divisional charts, very few avashtas, all the things we're supposed to look at. All we did, we made the chart, and we went through and saw you know, Venus rules the fourth and the eleventh house, and it goes into the second, and so therefore, what does it mean? We got out the Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, Volume 2. We simply flipped to that page. I didn't try to make it up for you based on what I knew about the Dalai Lama to make it fit the chart. All I did was I read that paragraph, and we saw how probably, what, 60 to 80 percent of most of everything we read about these positions fit the Dalai Lama, right? So those are the karmas that he has, essentially. You'll have that too. But you'll see that there are these planets in these signs, which means that you can, you can conceptualize his chakras. You can conceptualize his chakras. Just like when we put your chart up there, we'll be able to conceptualize what kind of energies are going on in your chakras. Yeah, and this is really what makes for you as Ayurvedic, uh, future Ayurvedic practitioners, what this information is going to allow you to do is get a sense of what is the state of their inner energetic system. And when meditation comes into play, when you are bringing your awareness to the chakras within your body, when you're bringing awareness to the chakras within your body, um, you, you are essentially becoming aware of the karmas in those chakras, and when you're meditating there, it may be that certain things come into your awareness, certain feelings, certain memories, certain experiences. And as long as you hold your awareness, let's just say um, at the fourth chakra, which is Taurus and Libra. And let's say, like the Dalai Lama, you have Mars in, in uh, Libra. You hold your awareness there. Well, then any karmas that need to be resolved around that quality, that energy of Mars, uh, you are able to observe it. You are able to watch it rise and then with detachment and patience and calm it resolves itself so that is why doing meditations that focus on uh, the spine which is like our, our our own inner zodiac doing meditations that focus on the chakras essentially help to balance out the karmas related by the planets in the signs in your astrological chart now there's two levels to that. It can balance it out such that it can balance it out such that um, such that you become aware of it. And again, as it says in the Yoga Sutras, the pain which has not yet been experienced is to be avoided. You know, when someone points out to you you're going to go down a very difficult path here if you make this choice. Well, the meditation within that karmic under, with that karmic understanding will give you a little more pause so that when you recognize you're about to do something that your astrologer has told you is going to lead you down a difficult route, maybe you'll pause and you'll say, I really want to do that, <laughs> but I'm not going to, right? I'm not going to. And then you let it go. And so it gives you the capacity to avoid the difficulty that that karma represents potentially. The other, the other side of that is if, 
If the meditation doesn't give you the capacity to avoid the difficulty, what it will do is give you the poise and the detachment and the sense of grace to deal with whatever it is. Because remember, again, throughout the Yoga Sutras and um, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, there are phrases such as, you know, the yogi learns to patiently endure difficulties. Right? And that comes up over and over again. So by doing the meditations on the chakras, it, it actively works with the karmas. If it doesn't neutralize them, then what it does is it gives you the ability to sail your ship through that karma. Right? Um, now, in the Bhagavad Gita, we talked about this, or this was brought up yesterday, with the idea, the Bhagavad Gita is about a war. Remember us discussing that? And I mentioned that was a metaphor for the spiritual path. Um, at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, there are some verses that essentially affirm to Arjuna, which is the person walking the spiritual path, that victory is assured if he just does what he's supposed to do. Victory is assured if he just does what he's supposed to do. But there are two sides to this war. There's the, the family and the people that he knows that represent things like egotism, you know, overthinking things, pride, vanity, arrogance, uh, memory. Memory is considered to be uh, one of the things that needs to be overcome because it's memory that keeps us attached to the past, which keeps us from being present, which keeps us from dealing with things as appropriately. But it says that there's descriptions of, and then the Pandavas will blow their conchs, blow their horns. And these are repre representative of the sounds of the chakras, directing your awareness back to the vibrations within the spine, within the chakras. And so that is why by returning your awareness inward to the chakras, to your inner zodiac, by learning to listen, to hear, to feel, to imagine, to experience these areas within the body, that enlivens your capacity to rise above the karmas related to your inner zodiac. And that is why sound meditation, and by that I don't mean get a crystal bowl and you know do the sound, although that's neat too. By sound meditation, I mean learning to get so still, so still that you're able to turn within and at first you begin to hear like a high-pitched sound or a tone. It's almost like you hear a constant hum in your ears. Have any of you gone to like a church or a meditation retreat where it's really quiet and there's no sound really, but you hear this almost like a buzz? You know what I'm talking about? Well, that is considered to be the initial, uh, the, the initial capacity to hear the OM vibration. The OM vibration. And chanting OM helps, but again, in the Yoga Sutras, in the first chapter, um, it specifically states, which is really, really neat. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> the inner sound current, so it describes Om as the inner sound current. And this is chapter 1, uh, sutras 27 through 29 of the Yoga Sutras. The inner sound current, or Om, is the expression of Ishvara. Ishvara is God or the Lord of the universe. Repetition of the inner sound current leads to realization of its meaning. From that comes the realization of an inwardly directed consciousness and the elimination of obstacles. Now, in this context, it's talking about the elimination of obstacles to clarity and awakening in your spiritual path. But what's fascinating from an astrological standpoint, maybe it's just a mythological standpoint, is that Ganesh, remember the elephant-headed god? Uh, Ganesh is, is related to the Om vibration. By learning to hear the Om vibration, listening to Om, that, that is in a way attuning to that power of this divine infinite consciousness that is Ganesh, which removes the obstacles. And the reason it removes the obstacles to your life is because it helps to, in a way, like bleach out or burn away these karmas as indicated by your astrological chart. Now back to this idea of the chakras. When you first learn to hear this Om vibration, if you do it well, I mean, you really have to spend some time trying to figure out how to do it. It's not, it's slippery. Like this is, this is one of the easiest, yet most profound techniques there is, but because it's so subtle and so quiet, it's like that still small voice within they talk about. You really have to get quiet to hear it. But once you do, 
then you can start bringing your awareness to your chakras and the best way to do it is to start at the bottom start at the bottom and go up so there are certain techniques which we may do later today where you start at the bottom and you go up and then you go back down but if you go back down you always want to go back up so when you end you want to end up here not down here okay you all know about the uh, movements of the pranas within the body right um, well you're right there are certain times when you want uh, apana, uh, apana to go downward but most of the time as described in yogic literature by learning to redirect those energy currents upward the body becomes radiant healthy brilliant these sorts of things and that's written about in the yoga sutras um, but what happens is let's say you bring your awareness down to the root chakra and you're able to hear this sound well by holding your awareness on the root chakra and listening um, you will hear a particular tone vibration or frequency and these are described in yogic literature but I'm not going to try to fill your head so that you uh, look for it I want you to discover it for yourself and then you bring your awareness up to the second chakra and there'll be a different quality to that sound that you hear and feel internally so each chakra has a different quality or sound or vibration to it and relating back to the Bhagavad Gita by by doing that by going through the chakras and just listening watching observing that is like you know, taking that, that part of Arjuna's army, which you want engaged to lift you up and experience self-realization, it's like they're blowing their horns, their conks, which, which neutralizes as many of the karmas as is possible. So this is why, again, we, talk a lot, we talked a lot about um, wanting to practice astrology without having to know astrology. Well, the yogi is essentially doing that. Uh, Sri Yogananda's Yogananda's um, teacher, uh, he would always say, or well, what I've heard, he didn't tell me, <laughs> um, he would always say <laughs> that, uh, that, that yoga is really the inner astrology, it's the true astrology, because it's the inner astrology, it's not looking for something outside of oneself. Uh, my friend and teacher Richard Fish, who co-wrote the books The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, he was also a Kriya Yoga teacher, um, but he would always say the same thing. He would tell me that you know, by doing this inner work, you really kind of don't need the outer astrology. In the same way that when an astrologer um, gets good at learning the techniques and the principles, and, but is also doing meditation, and that's part of their path, as they get older, they really don't even need to look at the chart anymore. Because they are able to simply be aware of their own inner state, and when they interact with someone else, they have a capacity somehow to know the other person's inner state and then they can just simply speak directly to it without saying oh your son is debilitated in this sign and aspected by that planet and so on they can just speak directly to it um, one astrologer I believe he was, he was in his 80s uh, when he gave this interview he was an Indian astrologer from India and someone asked him uh, what is the most important thing that an astrologer can do to be good at astrology? Like, what, what is it that every astrologer needs to know how to do? And the questioner, I think, was expecting some you know, profound technique or so, some profound system that they needed to learn. Uh, and the astrologer simply said, always tell the truth. And he didn't mean just in your astrological sessions. He meant always tell the truth as you know it and as you feel it. Now, why is this important? If you always told the truth, you wouldn't need astrology. Why is that? This is, this, is, as, as, this is my experience of it. The more you tell the truth, the more you live in your own truth. So telling the truth isn't just simply using words. It's what is true for me right now? What, where do, what do I need to be doing? Where do I need to be? How do I need to interact with this person? What is appropriate, really appropriate right now? Which often relates to a gut feeling or a feeling in the heart or an uplifted feeling that you have uh, internally um, when you do that consistently you then learn you then understand what it feel what truth feels like you know what it feels like in the same way that have you when someone's told you a lie didn't you get kind of a feeling like yeah they're lying or when you tell a lie or when you say or when you do something that's not quite true to your nature you know how you get that kind of sinking feeling a little bit? Well, usually for me, 
telling the truth, feeling the truth is the opposite of that. It feels like strong. It feels like strength. So if you always tell, if you start today always telling the truth, it doesn't mean you hurt people's feelings. It just means that you know you are true with what you say. And someone asks you a question, and you don't know the answer to that question. What's the truth there? I don't know. So you just simply say, I don't know. But then there may be certain situations where they come to you and they ask you something and you have no idea how you know, but there's a knowing that this is the right response to that. You just say it, right? You, you don't know where it's gonna go. Remember, you're entitled to action only, not the fruits of your actions. You don't know why you're supposed to say that to that person and it doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's a truth that needs to be expressed for some reason. So then, then let's, let's say you're an astrologer and someone comes up to you and says, oh, I've, I've been to five astrologers. I've heard that my, uh, my Saturn cycle is going to be horrible and it's about to start in two years. And you think about it for a minute and um, you, you're kind of mulling over in your mind to say, yeah, it's going to be horrible. But as soon as you start to think about that, you get that sinking feeling like it's not quite right. And then you start thinking about saying, you know, I really think it's probably going to be all right. And that feels strong. Not false hope, not like you're just trying to like make someone feel good because they're afraid, but because that's what feels true. You know what? Don't even look at their chart. <coughs> just say, I think it's probably going to be fine. Now again, that will apply to those of you who stick to speaking the truth. Because if you, if you kind of do it sometimes but not other times, then it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. It may be true what you're going to say, but it may not because you're still kind of on the fence about things there. You see what I'm trying to get at? Um, the same will be true when you're reading an astrological chart. Remember I told you that when I did sidereal uh, astrology or used the sidereal zodiac, you know, one of the best things that, that gave fantastic sessions to people was I got out my list that I have in the Art and Science of Vedic Astrology Volume 2 about, again, like Second Lord and the Fourth House and so on, where it's got paragraphs for what could possibly be there. And I would just see where the positions are, and I'd go through and I'd just look at that paragraph and I'd kind of say them to myself. And the ones that felt like that sense of truth, that's what I'd write down to say. And that was my intuitive way of doing that, which in that situation, it doesn't really matter which zodiac you're using because you're able to get to the truth at it in that regard. Um, so astrologers, when they start to look at a chart, uh, they can look at things and possibilities, and as they kind of run it through their mind and their awareness, if they practice the truth, then they start to, they just recognize those things that stand out that probably are accurate for this person. So that's how astrology can be done very, 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 very well without going down the rabbit hole of my four-year apprenticeship program. <laughs> um, uh, but with your Ayurvedic practice, it's going to be the same thing because you've got diagnostic tools, you've got information that you need to figure out, which it, it's the exact same thing. If you are established in truth, which is one of the most important um, uh, parts of the yamas and niyamas and the yoga sutras, as, a, as an Ayurvedic practitioner, um, then when you're thinking about certain terminology, certain herbs to recommend, certain practices to recommend, you will have a resonation or a feeling or a sense of, yeah, this is the way I need to do it. Yeah, but Vishnu told me that's not how I should do it. But your truth at this point in time is, 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 specific, to, um, is specific to the moment of the person you're interacting with. Okay. And so that's where we kind of take the idea of astrology and even Ayurveda and all of these practices and meditation, yoga, as being an art and a science. You learn the basics, you read the books, you get the knowledge in your head, but then when it comes down to it, the moment of participation is not broken down into numbers and binary things, it's a, a living expression of life, a living expression of truth. And meditation also helps you to recognize truth. Because the more you're able to turn within and, and watch and observe, not get caught up in the karmas or the subconscious conditionings, um, the less you will be motivated to try to pacify someone's fears just because you don't like seeing someone who's afraid. You know, that's why like, uh, I remember reading in one of these Ayurvedic texts one time, it was a, a modern book, I think it was um, when it was discussing dealing with someone with a vata nature, with a pitta nature, and with a predominantly kapha nature, it said with the vata nature, you have to repeat yourself a lot. 
you have to get them to come back once or twice a week and sort of stay on top of it and just remind them and kind of keep them on track with the routine. Uh, so with a, with a pit of nature person, all you have to do is tell them why they're doing it. You just have to explain, this is why it's important. And they'll be like, okay, great. If it's logical and makes sense, then they'll do it. And, and then it went on to say, and for a coffin nature, oftentimes you have to scare them. <laughs> you have to scare them into movement, because otherwise they're just going to probably remain sedentary, and they're going to say, well, you know, okay, we'll see what happens. But if you scare them, then, that, then in a way that kind of motivates them. Um, and I think that kind of makes sense when, I, when I've talked to people uh, with those kinds of natures. But to come back to this whole idea of meditation, uh, the meditation practice is key to all these things that you're learning, I think, from my experience. Um, the types of meditation that are important to do for this are meditations that work on this central channel in your body. You know, mindfulness meditation is great, um, TM, mantra meditation is great, but for these purposes, any kind of meditation that works on these central channels. One of the things I love to do to start all meditations is alternate nostril breathing. Does anyone not know how to do that? Great. Just for, just for saying it. You know, alternate nostril breathing, essentially what you're doing, the basics of it, is you are breathing through one nostril in, the opposite nostril out, then back in the same nostril, then back out. That's like one repetition of alternate nostril breathing. You do that 12 to 24 rounds. What does that do? It balances the left and right sides of the brain, it balances the Eden Pangala, it balances the lunar and solar forces of the body. It tends to keep you healthier. Um, I do that almost every day when I'm by myself meditating, that's how I start, 24 rounds, 24 to 27 rounds of alternate nostril breathing. Then, um, doing some form of uh, internal meditation practice that brings awareness to the spine, either by circulating life force through the spine, like breathing in through the spine, letting it flow out, or the best one for everyone all the time is simply learning to chant through the chakras. The reason I say that is because um, basically if you're menstruating, pregnant, emotionally disturbed, or sick, you don't want to be taking your energy and, and forcing it up into the higher centers. You want to let your body do what it needs to do to heal itself. And that's where you know, a pana can be helpful to just let it flow. Um, but chanting through the chakras is, is not necessarily forcing that current up, it's simply bringing awareness to these, uh, the chakras within your body and also the signs within your inner zodiac. We'll do, some, we'll do some of that together here today, again, just to kind of bring that home for you. Um, but this is essentially all I really wanted to say about meditation and astrology and essentially all the other kind of work you're doing um, to emphasize why it's so important for you. So we'll just take some questions and then we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and meditate together and then we'll get back on with our study of charts for today and we'll start to see how um, Ayurveda really relates to how we can see like Ayurvedic constitution or um, potential weaknesses and strengths within a chart uh, from an Ayurvedic perspective. So we'll just go around the room like always. Any questions or comments? Yes, would you please repeat the first few sentences you said at the beginning of your speech about the relationship to pain. Um, mm, that was a while ago. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean it was it a sutra? Yeah. About the, the pain that is not yet experienced is to be avoided? Oh, um, the root the, cause. The, the, yeah, yeah. Lack of self-awareness is the root cause of pain. Thank you. Lack of self-awareness is the root cause of pain. And I, I believe that's in chapter one of the Yoga Sutras. I... I know I've got it written down, and it's in my phone, but I can't get the Wi-Fi to work to pull up my little document where I've got these things. It's familiar. Written down, yeah. But there's only 200 sutras, so you can find it. <laughs> 196, I think, but anyway. discussion right now, but something that's just been kind of on my mind uh, over the night was, I was starting to explain some of this to my husband, and he's like, he always challenges me, he's like, you know, is this fate or is this free will? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, I was like, well, it's 
it's kind of neither and both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of curious how you describe when someone asks that. Well, again, you, you already know my position that, you know, <laughs> everything's going to happen the way it's going to happen. But there is a better way to look at it to help ease your mind. Um, <laughs> uh, think about this way. Uh, we'll, we'll use the example of, uh, of, of the army or a military operation. Um, you've got someone in charge of the military operation. So there's a plan, right? But then you've got the individual soldiers or participants who have to follow that plan but they have the capacity to do what they need to do to act to make that plan work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So that, that's how I describe it. It's like, there, there is, it's, it's like there's a general saying this is what's going to happen, but then you're the little foot soldier that's going to listen to the general, but when you're actually in the field, you still have to make your own decisions. Right. So um, that's how I would describe it. And that makes perfect sense. Um, he's actually in the army. Yeah. yeah. So um, that makes perfect sense to me because he was asking, like, well, where do you get this yeah. knowledge from? And I'm like, it's just above. Yeah. And, you know, where he's at, like, he's obviously not a general. So right. it's like, um, you have to just do it. You have to believe it. And you can't just be like, oh, general, like, can I ask you why this is? Right. You just have to trust that that is what that is. You can ask why it is. Well, yeah. I mean, but <laughs> I mean that, that's, that's part of an, an interesting aspect that people sometimes miss when it comes to spirituality. You know, going through... Um, a lot of these texts, yes, there are books that talk about like reverencing your guru and teacher and things, but for example, in the Yoga Sutras, there's no, there's no sutra that says that. Mm -hmm. What it says though is by listening to the Om vibration and tuning to the Om, you are essentially like that, that is the teacher of even the ancients. Yeah. So, what does that tell you? That you can go directly to the source if you do it with intention and commitment and you do it well enough. Because this is supposed to be, it's a Veda, and you know, there's Ayurveda, right? Knowledge of life. And, but, and there are the Vedas. And people can think of the Vedas as these are these four books where things have been recorded, they're important. But Veda means self revealed knowledge. Self revealed knowledge. Yeah. Not the knowledge that the 30 people before you handed down and gave you. It may be that they, they, they were able to grasp it, and yes, they can just tell it to you. But self-revealed knowledge means that you can access it yourself because you are part of all of this. You know? um, I, I think that that is an important thing to remember. Again, it does require the practice of truth, as best you know it, and consistent meditation practice, because it's real easy to fall into some kind of fantasy about who you think you are and what you know. <laughs> So, but it is possible to have self-revealed knowledge. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so we'll keep going around. Um, just with the chanting of the um, sound, um, in the chakras, is there, be, like, is there a time and place for seed sounds? And, or yeah, I mean, I, I, ju I just teach OM uh, chanting through the chakras in groups like this because we only have, you know, three days together. But if you know the, the seed syllables of the chakras, just replace OM for the seed syllables. Yeah. I just didn't know because Om was breaking up, you know, removing obstacles. So well, Om is, is the, the initial, one of these, like the idea of the initial expression of, of the Godhead, right? So yeah, it's going to break up obstacles and things, but there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> you know? A lot, of the, a lot of the seed syllables are related to things like elements, right? Which would create that. Yeah. So, but om, 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 is, om is good for just about everything. I mean, there's a reason they say, you know, you begin every prayer with Om. You, know, you, you, you begin every discourse with Om. <laughs> like everything starts with Om. But anyway. <laughs> so, um, you were mentioning about how maybe once you start getting into yogic philosophy or practices, you notice maybe you start to change and people around you don't have heard the same, but kind of like you become like the environment and the people that you place yourself in, right. you know? So is there anything else that you could say to just, you know, adapting or like dealing with people who are in your life all the time who aren't trying to practice the yoga lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they do, but maybe they're just slow or there's certain things that... 
you know, how it, is that? It just depends on like what what kind of relationship we're talking about. Like wife, for for children. what what's that? Wife, children. Well, okay. So basically, <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't speak to children too much. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was fortunate in that Melissa she became interested in in Kriya Yoga and meditation pretty much around the same time I did. But you know, as I've told people in the, the Kriya Yoga apprenticeship course, um, we never talked about it. Like it was not like a thing where you know you get the two Baptists together and they're like all about talking about Jesus all the time or whatever it might be. She did her thing, I did my thing. Um, and I remember when I was I was young and stupid. And, uh, and I was very fanatical about my spiritual path. And I, I mean, I was committed. I would get up as early as possible, meditate as long as possible. Everything I did was about what I thought Kriya Yoga was about. And I remember watching Melissa, who wasn't meditating as much as I was, who didn't seem to have the same kind of like reading, you must read these books all the time. She didn't have that. She really didn't need it because she was already pretty peaceful and calm. <laughs> but um, I remember that one time I, I said to her, I was like, look, if, if you're not, if, if this isn't as important to you as it is to me, well then, like, I'm not sure where this is going. <laughs> and I remember we went to visit, we went to visit Roy and she, she said, she said that to him. He looked at me and he said, you leave her alone. <laughs> he, said, he said, you let her do what she needs to do and you do what you need to do. So in that kind of situation, um, basically what happened if you've got a good relationship with a spouse, I mean, you love each other, you're supportive of each other, uh, that's all that matters. So whatever you do with, with your spiritual practice, even if you don't have the same spiritual practice, that doesn't matter. Now, if your spouse is an alcoholic and wants to go out dancing every night and like sleep in late and you're trying to like wake up in the morning and not eat bacon and whatever it might be, then you kind of got to work something out. Okay. But I'm thinking maybe you guys are fairly compatible in the regard to supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, the so lifestyle things is just yeah. Well, yeah. don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, you know. And again, that's coming from my experience and towards the end of Melissa's life, realizing there was a lot of stupid shit that I said that really didn't matter at all. You know, like why do you have to fall asleep watching Friends every night? <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck cares? You know. <laughs> Just, just stuff like that, you know. And one person, one person in uh, in the Kriya Yoga apprenticeship program, I remember he wrote to me and he's like, "My wife just love. He's he's younger than me. He's like, my wife loves to go antique shopping on Saturdays, you know. And it just seems like she's interested in just frivolous things." I was like, "Just go antique shopping with your wife. I was like, just love her and support her in that way." And so the the, the homework I gave him, he was expecting me to say, "Meditate for two hours every day on whatever." I said. Before I talk to you again, you better have scheduled dancing lessons with your wife. So just things like that. But on the other side of it, again, I can't speak to kids, so sorry. But um, on the other side of it, when I became interested in, in, in all these things, meditation, Ayurveda, um, people have heard this story before, not you, but probably the folks who are listening, um, at home, um, before I got into all this stuff, uh, I smoked all the time. I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, I drank beer quite often. We had meat parties on Friday. Um, I was 40 pounds overweight. Uh, I was pretty angry and depressed, but I was interested in philosophy and things, which kind of drew me to this. But as soon as I became aware of autobiography of yogi, meditation, these sorts of things, I immediately became a vegetarian quit smoking, quit drinking. This was before I was 21. I was supposed to have a, a pig roast and a, a keg party for my 21st birthday. My friends were like, what? <laughs> I thought we were gonna, you know. And so when I made that change, I started going to bed early, waking up early, or yeah, going to bed early and waking up early. I pretty much lost all but one friend when I made that choice. And then what happened was though, as life went on, as the years went by, as my friends got older that I knew at that point in time, many of them came back into my life. And they just sort of knew what I was about and what I did, and they did what they did. And we never talked about spirituality. You know, we'd go ax throwing or playing darts or whatever. And um, we would just enjoy that friendship. But they knew Ryan's gonna, go, Ryan's gonna leave at eight because he wants to go home and meditate and go to bed early. Whereas they would harass me before when, we, when I was in my early 20s, now they just accept it. 
So what I found is that when those kinds of changes come up, you have to make the changes that are right for you. Let the other people just adjust or adapt however they can. And then in time, those people that probably are really important in your life will, will come back around. You know? And many of the people, this is what fascinates me. So I spent, what, 10 years here in Asheville. Melissa and I spent 10 years here in Asheville. We, we started a meditation center uh, over in West Asheville. Um, participated in all this spiritual community and I remembered all my friends from high school uh, doing their own thing, not interested in any of this at all because we're all from West Virginia. And, um, and so I moved back home uh, in September and what do I find but a meditation group I never would have found in Asheville. Like these people are serious, they're mature about it, they're there's a, there's a large number of them, and they're exploring really interesting, diverse, philosophical topics. Um, and when I was in Asheville, it just drove me nuts, because every time I'd start a meditation group, it's like I got all these new age fluffy people that they'd come in, and their first question wasn't, how do I meditate? It was, so, how many people come here? You know, I'm like, you should probably just leave, <laughs> because it doesn't matter how many people come here. Uh, and then many of my friends had moved back to West Virginia as well, and I'm finding out now, they're into Zen Buddhism, they've become vegetarian, you know, so it's interesting that what you'll find is as you change, there are certain periods of time where you have to make it, you have to, you have to invoke Kali. You have to destroy <laughs> what you think you were and then see what comes out of the ashes afterwards. Um, so really with that, uh, hopefully I answered your question, it's just about doing what's true for you, being loving and kind to those people that you're meant to be loving and kind to, and if they support you, great. But you don't have to get in, it doesn't have to be a shared outward thing, as long as there's support and love there. Right? Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. okay. Great. So we'll back. Two questions. And I think I know the answer to the first one, so I'm going to try to phrase it in a more helpful way. But um, with starting a regular routine for meditation, mm -hmm. how do you kind of break through that initial inertia? You had it. So, for instance, um, you know, I, I I love meditation. You know, it feels great when I meditate. I love it. It's just my whole day. But at six a.m., sometimes I'm just like, it feels so good in my bed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe this is more helpful to me right now than meditating, and I'll hit snooze. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, how do you kind of get past that initially? I can tell you exactly how I did it. <clears throat> um, yeah. So again, this is one of the <clears throat> difficult, one of the initial difficulties that Melissa and I had when I got into meditation, because we were living together at that time, and it's sort of hard to get out of bed when there's a really pretty girl beside you. <laughs> and, and so, so I would wake up and that would happen. Finally, I realized I, 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 this is important to me to meditate. So our first big difficulty in this regard was we had another room. So I got a cot. I slept in the other room for the first six months. She's like, what? And I was like, look, I love you. Everything's still fine. There's nothing weird going on here. It's just that for me, it is important that I need to get up at this time to meditate. So I have to do this. And again, there were some hurt feelings for about three months, um, but eventually she understood why. Um, so that was one thing I had to do uh, for that reason. The other thing, once we got beyond that and I started, you know, just we started uh, staying in the same bed again was you set your alarm, and you have to tell yourself the night before, the moment that alarm goes off, you sit up, and you go sit down to where you're going to meditate. You don't let yourself think, and if you're thinking anything, you ignore it. Mm -hmm. So what you, have to, what you have to do is when that moment comes up, well, it might be better. No. You say, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and you walk over, and you, you, you make it somewhere else. And you sit down, either cross-legged or in your chair, wherever your meditation spot is, and then you start meditating. That's the only way that I found to break that inertia. Because if you decide, and I do this with other things in life too, um, like if I need to get something done, I will set an alarm, and I will say, I'm doing this for an hour. Once that alarm stops, I'm done, I go do something else. Or I'll say, you know, I've got to do this work, but I've also got to finish up my taxes, so I'm going to set the alarm for 10 a.m., as soon as 10 a.m. runs, that alarm goes off, I stop everything that I'm doing, and I go and I start doing my taxes. No matter what's going on in my head, I just sit down and start doing it. If you do that, I would say probably in a week or two, you won't have any problems with it. 
but it, always remember, yes, you want to be kind and compassionate to yourself, but sometimes you got to kick your own ass. Okay. And that's, that's true for this, too. So. And then my second question is, yeah. um, with regard to the chakra meditations, and you know, you're sitting there in stillness, and you hear maybe a bit of humming, mm -hmm. you know, is it the refrigerator, <laughs> is, it the, mm -hmm. is it actually a chakra? Is this something that you intuitively know? It, 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 is, it is a sound that you, that's unmistakable. Okay. So when you hear it, you know you're hearing it. And when you're doing it, maybe we'll try to do it here. I think it'll be quiet enough to do it. When, when you do it, it starts out like a, just a consistent hum. It might even be the lights that you hear at first. But it doesn't matter because eventually if you have to hold your awareness on it. And then when you do it long enough, you'll start to hear it maybe wobble a little bit or you'll lose it and then you kind of got to dig into it a little bit more. But the meditation process for that is not, am I successful because I hear it all the time and it's deep, it's are you listening for it? Mm -hmm. And what happens is, and when you're, when you're listening for something, you know, Eckhart Tolle explained this very well when he, when he talked about, um, it's like when you look at a mouse watching a mouse hole, you know, or it's not a mouse, when you watch a cat watching a mouse hole, that cat, there's no mouse there yet, but it's watching it and it's ready. It's not thinking about anything. It's just waiting for that mouse. So this kind of meditation technique is like that. It's like the cat trying to watch the mouse hole. And eventually you'll catch it. Um, and then what happens is it'll get deeper. Like when I first did this very well, I heard the sound and I was able to hold my awareness on it. And if distractions arise, that's not a problem. You just say, okay, now come back to the sound. But once it starts to get deeper, it gets louder and it fills up more of your awareness. And the first time I did this very well, it was almost like all, it grew into the sound of like the roaring of an ocean. Like when you put like a shell to your ear or you hear that roar and it just gets louder and louder and that's all you are aware of. So you can practice in such a way that that occurs, but if that doesn't occur, that's not a problem. It's, it's the practice of the looking or listening in this case and waiting, right? And then the sounds will change. As they say, it'll sound like, the buzzing of bees or the plucking of a harp or the sound of a flute, you will actually hear that. But the, to do that, this is why your yoga practice, not just uh, the philosophical, but the getting enough rest, having your body strong and healthy, um, being able to relax yet stay awake is the key. Any of those techniques that, that talk about seeing an inner light or hearing the sound, what is required is that the body is upright, yet relaxed. That, that you are present and alert, yet relaxed and not falling asleep. And I discovered this by accident one time when um, I was actually trying to take a nap, but I wasn't sleepy and I did yoga nidra. And I let my body just completely relax. And yet I was aware, I was watched what I could see. And then in that in that relaxation, the light appeared. And I noticed the moment I was like, oh, there it is. It went away. But if I learned, again, the way I look at it, you gotta be cool. You gotta be cool about it. <laughs> when it shows up, if you can just be like, all right, it's, it's cool. <laughs> and, 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 and you let your body relax, it gets brighter and it gets louder. But the key is how can you stay present, relaxed, without falling asleep? And the, the key to success is eating a good diet, having a strong body so that you can stay upright without distraction, and getting enough rest such that when you, when, you're, when you start to relax, you don't just nod off, right? So if you can work that out, if you can, if you can figure out, so listen to that and try to figure out how can I do that, that's when these kinds of things become much easier to, to experience. And I guess it's also kind of the same way with learning which chakra it is that you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, all you do is the chakra that you are hearing is the one that you, you have, is where you have awareness. It's like if you have awareness at the third chakra and you're listening, the sounds that arise while you have awareness at that third chakra, those are the sounds of that chakra. Okay. Um, and again, they do give ideas of what those sounds could be, but we're all pretty different. And it's also being translated through whatever your karmas are. So again, once you really clear out whatever that stuff is in there, then it will be more likely to probably be what the textbooks say it is. 
But in the meantime, you know, you're, you're still kind of translating it through whatever planets are there, how those chakras are being influenced. Okay. Did you have a follow-up? I was just curious about Saturn and if like invoking Saturn would be useful for kind of cultivating self-discipline. Yeah. And... Yeah. I mean, Saturn is, Saturn is what we were just talking about. Yeah. No complaints. Just get up and do it. Yeah. You know, so um, I've done Saturn mantras all my life uh, just because of how it influences my chart. But... I feel it's been of benefit because it's allowed me to have that mentality of, you know, Melissa always used to make fun of me because she'd say, um, you know, you don't do something because you like it, you do it because you, you're supposed to, you, but you don't do it because you like it, you do it because it's good for you. Yeah. And that's a very Saturn kind of a, approach to things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, Bruce Lee had a prominent Saturn as well. Um, <laughs> but the idea of it is when you, when you engage that Saturn, and if you think about it, it's really wonderful. Um, okay, so just we'll take a little digression here. Um, we know that we've got the, the sixth chakra with uh, Leo and Cancer, right? Which is the sixth chakra up here. Now, the next chakra is Virgo and uh, Gemini which is ruled over by Mercury. Okay. And the next chakra is Taurus and Libra, or Taurus and Libra, which is ruled over by Venus. Then we've got Mars for Aries and Scorpio. Then we've got Jupiter for um, uh, Pisces and Sagittarius. And then Saturn for the first chakra, Capricorn and Aquarius. Now, think about the order of the planets from the sun. So where's the sun? What's the first planet from the sun? Mercury. Mercury. What planet comes next? Venus. Venus? Yeah, Venus. Then what planet? Other than the Earth. So there's the Earth. And then what's the next planet after the Earth? Mars. Mars. And then what? Jupiter. Jupiter, Pisces, second chakra. And then what? Saturn. So you see the chakras, it's like the solar system. The sun all the way down to Saturn. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, and where we have the light from the sun and the moon, you know, up here in the, the sixth chakra, well, one of the things that Saturn helps us do